Perfect. Uh, well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it is with great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Chris Burns from University of Sussex. It is a bit um, unnerving how young Chris looks, <laughs> uh, considering his background. Um, uh, he did his, uh, I guess, initial studies all in the UK, finished his PhD in Portsmouth, and then off to postdocs in uh, Billfield and Heidelberg and CERN. And then back to the UK um, from 2012, uh, yeah, 2012 in University of Sussex as a Royal Society Fellow and now as a reader. And uh, his work covers uh, early universe cosmology, late universe cosmology, particle physics even. And uh, today he's going to tell us about uh, supermassive black holes, primordial, if they are or not, and I'm guessing some inflation. Mm -hmm. The floor is yours, Chris. Thank you very much. Thanks for the kind introduction, Venus. Uh, thanks for suggesting me as a speaker, Jasmine. Right, so yeah, first of all, just to give credit uh, where it's due, I'm going to mainly talk about two papers written by, well, in collaboration with two others, Devan Chu Sharma and Julian Lesburg from Aachen University, um, but also touching on many other works um, with many other brilliant collaborators, including lots of PhD students. I've been working in this field, not specifically supermassive black holes, but primordial black holes for over a decade now. Um, all right, so supermassive black holes in one slide. Well, they exist, most certainly. They're in the center of many and probably nearly all galaxies. Um, I say probably because the observations are not always good enough to know, but more or less whenever they are searched for, they are found. Um, and interestingly, they can be seen even at high redshift, so when the universe was a lot younger than today. So basically, they're pretty awesome objects. Um, roughly speaking, they are the size of our sun, but they have the mass of more than a million suns. So, you know, pretty... Pretty impressive thing. And if you're interested, there's a very nice review, not too long in Nature by Voluntary et al. Um, primordial black holes, which may or may not be related, um, are how I got into this field. So primordial black holes are there if they exist as a means to probe the initial conditions and the contents of the universe. And that's how we can potentially link to inflation. So black holes, they're certainly cold, they're certainly in terms of relative velocities, they're certainly dark. Um, so they are a dark matter candidate. And I'm not going to repeat the evidence for dark matter. I'll assume you know that. But please feel free to jump in, ask questions at any point. In my head, we've got an hour. I've got like not too many slides. So do ask if you want me to, you know, to explain anything more. But um, just in a nutshell, the evidence for dark matter uh, is not just from galaxies, it's not just from things like the bullet cluster shown here, which shows how the dark matter sort of passed through with the stars, while the gas got st not stuck, but it's interacted with each other through electromagnetic forces. We know from the CMB that the dark matter was around before the CMB, we know from Big Bang nuclear synthesis that dark matter was around even before then. So dark matter cannot be astrophysical black holes because astrophysical black holes have to come after the CMB formed. Primordial black holes are, if they exist, the, the black holes from before nucleus synthesis, so from the very early universe. And hence they are a very special dark matter candidate because they're not a new particle. And sometimes when I give this sort of talk to particle theorists, they're a bit annoyed because they want to say that, you know, dark matter is a new particle. Well, it might be, it, that is the favored model, but we don't know. And something else special about primordial black holes is they can form with, in principle, any mass. Sorry, well, could you physical black me? holes cannot uh, be very long. Uh, yeah, please. May I jump in already with a question? Yeah, 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 please uh, do. Whenever you say primordial black holes, you say if they exist. Yes. Uh, wouldn't you have to fine tune your models for them not to exist? So. Sadly not. And rather the opposite, you would have to tune them to exist. Oh, I see. Okay. Um, it's not a generic expectation of the early universe that you would generate primordial black holes. I wish it was. 
Yeah. Um, and of course, you may have heard, say, a talk by Juan García Vallido or some of the strong believers in the field, or even Bernard Carr is coming around to the opinion that they're very likely. Uh -huh. But um, that's not the community consensus. It's rather that the early universe would have been much more homogeneous. Yes. More, and hence, the density gradients would be smaller and unsuitable for black hole formation. You, you need to do something special normally to, to make the early universe inhomogeneous uh, enough such that they would form. If I, if I might add, just you were showing us the bullet cluster there, but my, I have this recollection that the bullet cluster is usually quoted as uh, evidence against primordial black holes. Oh, really? No, I think it's used against uh, modified gravity. Yes. It's used against modified gravity. The, yeah. That's certainly true. But I, yeah. can't, I have this recollection that uh, that is very hard to reconcile it with um, uh, primordial black holes as well. But maybe I'm... I think that's right. I mean, there, there would be, if they were very, very massive, then, then you might start to run into problems. But uh, right, the bullet cluster really shows that the... Um, so the blue areas are where the weak lensing shows the masses. And you can see by eye, the mass is where the stars are, or yeah. the galaxies, while the pinkish is the gas, the gas temperature. So it shows that the gas has been stripped away from the stars because the stars don't have long range interactions, only gravity. And the fact that this is blue, meaning most of the mass is here, you can count the number of stars, multiply that by the mass of the star, it's far too small. So it shows the dark matter is here. Now, black holes would just pass by each other, the same as stars would. So there's no, no real issue here, no. Okay, all right, um, thanks. If you find this, I, I, I'm please feel free to email what, me if you do find that. What I, the I, reasoning I'm, I'm that is what I can't, I, I, it doesn't yeah. come to me. For modified gravity, for sure, it's a real challenge. And like, you may have heard of MOND, which is Modified Newtonian Dynamics. That was mm. that can explain the galaxy rotation curve seen by Jocelyn Bell Burnell. Um, but it can explain that, but not everything else. And now the evidence for dark matter includes the CMB, it includes the bullet cluster. Yeah. Um, to explain modified gravity in a way which suits all of those observations is nearly impossible. Mm. To the best of my knowledge, it unless you add in basically arbitrary number of free parameters, it is impossible. So back to my original question, the reason the primordial black holes are popular just because is just because they give us a new window into the early universe, not because uh, we think they must have existed. Or... That, that's right. So to learn about the early universe, you need a relic. You need something which has survived. Mm -hmm. And if you think about the huge pressures existing, most objects would simply be torn apart by the huge pressure. So you need some form of topological defect or a black hole or a gravitational wave. Mm -hmm. And I'll briefly mention gravitational waves as well. We need something which hasn't been destroyed again by the high pressures, forces of radiation, basically just wiping them out. Mm -hmm. um, and also just because, you know, there, there are more plausible, I think, dark matter particle candidates. Mm -hmm. But this, you know, if you, there are lots of them, and then this stands by itself in a whole category because it's not a new particle. Mm -hmm. So here you don't need any new physics, you rather need new initial conditions. Yeah, okay. So right here. Yeah. It's nice to have something special versus, you know, I'm just adding another term to my Lagrangian to create another particle. Yeah. That's my are perspective. There, mm -hmm. Are there other non-particle dark matter candidates? Not that I'm aware of, no. There are composite particles, so non-elementary particles, but they're nonetheless particles. And then modified gravity in principle, if you have no dark matter, but as we've just talked about, that that's not seen as really feasible. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I wouldn't want to promise that nobody's thought of some very exotic sort of, I don't know, boson star or whatever, but then you still, I think, need a new form of particle and new physics to explain dark matter. Okay, thank you. Okay. Right, and then the next slide is just showing, well, interest in this field has grown exponentially since the detection of gravitational waves, because that's our best probe now of black holes. Um, so I'll talk a bit more about that. So the contents, well, I'm going to 
give a bit more about what are supermassive black holes, what are primordial black holes. And then the challenge to putting them together is the cosmic mu distortion. So I'll explain what that is and why that's really hard to evade. And then finishing slightly pessimistic, well, <laughs> even if you can evade these, you'll, you'll find more challenges ahead. Okay, so back to supermassive black holes. Well, as I said, they're found most of the time when they're looked for, typically of a mass in between a million and a billion solar masses. So these are, you know, giants. <laughs> um, and interestingly, they're observed even at redshifts bigger than six to seven. That's well established. And there are claims from the James Webb Space Telescope that have even been seen at redshift 11. That's tentative. But nonetheless, already by redshift six, seven, you're talking about they need to have formed within about a billion years, a giga year. And it's really not known how to form something so big in gravitational collapse and standard cosmology so quickly. Furthermore, we know now from LIGO and Virgo and Kagra that there's a large population of astrophysical mass black holes between roughly three and, say, 50 solar masses. And then there is a large population of supermassive black holes. And there's just a few tentative detections of intermediate mass black holes. But basically, it seems to be very, very strongly bimodal. So that could be a hint of a completely different origin for these two masses. Otherwise, somehow you need to grow from the low mass to the high mass and not have lots of ones which have stopped growing and hence become stuck at the intermediate range. Um, is, is, sorry, is there reasonable data at this point on the numbers of uh, these massive black holes, these 10 to the seven, or, uh, 70 to 100 and something uh, solar mass black holes? Um, so with the supermassive, yes, it, it seems to be more or less the num same as the number of density of galaxies. But the uh, you mentioned as well the uh, these uh, very early uh, uh, mergers, which show the right. uh, uh, that there's oh, I see. is there an is, is there I haven't seen updated data on that, so I'm just curious to know what that right. Is. I I don't think we're there yet. No, at very high rate shift. I mean, this is a pretty recent plot, 2023. In fact, that nicely brings me to my next slide. So thank you. Showing um, so. I should be a little bit careful. This is the energy density compared to the critical density for the universe in quasars. Well, quasars are typically seen as a proxy for the supermassive black hole. Um, but with the caveat that we can only, a quasar is an active galactic nuclei, so one where stuff is happening. There may be more where which are not busy accreting, and then they're very hard to see. Because obviously we don't see a black hole per se, Things like the Event Horizon Telescope, they see the gas inspiring into the black hole. And if you don't have a lot of gas falling in, then it's black. Surprise, surprise. Um, and the frequency range for the merger of supermassive black holes is completely wrong for LIGO Virgo. So they can only see between about one and a hundred solar mass, not the supermassive. And um, but nonetheless, so this shows gives some idea of the number or the energy density in these different mass spins as a function of redshift. So time, remember, in cosmology goes the other way. So the high redshift universe is the early universe. And today we're at about 13 billion years. So if, if you imagine that all the supermassive black holes started very small and decreted, then this figure poses an immortal an obvious challenge, because you would think, well, if accretion happens, then it's going to keep going on. And the heaviest one should become more and more common at low redshift, but that doesn't seem to be the case. And this is not showing error bars, I should say, you know, there's, there are certainly uncertainties, the higher redshift, the bigger the uncertainty. But there's no sort of systematic trend to suggest that these black holes are just accreting and growing more and more heavy with the age of the universe. Um, and you can see they get really, really big. Um, now, there are none of these smaller masses seen at very high redshift, but that might be an observational effect, right? Because obviously they're going to get harder to see. And you're more likely to see the most massive ones, especially at the highest redshift. Um, so, and do you understand the mechanism? Is the mechanism for why the smaller ones that into the 70s into the 8 are growing? I would presume that 
that could be related to accretion, and some of them certainly are, some of them are seem to be accreting rapidly, but then why, you know, why you then don't then see that for the other ones? I don't know. Uh, I, I have to say though, I'm, I'm really a primordial black hole expert. I'm definitely not a supermassive black hole expert. I've learned enough to write two papers in my whole career on related to supermassive black holes. So yeah, I, I don't really know. I, I would assume though that selection effects are part of the problem here. It's simply going to be hard to see the less, you know, the less of the supermassive ones at high energy. Mm. Can I ask you just, I mean, you mentioned the Eddington limit there. Um, mm -hmm. But the Eddington limit it would only be relevant if these black holes were made out of baryonic matter. If they're made out of something else like dark matter, then the Eddington limit would be irrelevant. Um, well, what they're made out of, though, doesn't matter once it's a black hole. It's then a question of what does it accrete. Yes, but the Eddington limit is about luminosity blowing stuff off the surface and stopping them getting any heavier. And that's yeah. radiation pressure. Yes. So that's only for electro in, electromagnetically interacting particles. That's absolutely true. But what I mean is if, if you had a, a primordial supermassive black hole and then it formed a galaxy around it, which is baryonic matter, the, the accretion it would undergo once it's part of a galaxy will then be due to baryons, the same as if it was a yeah. astrophysical black hole. So once, once it's settled down and... Right, it's very hard to accrete dark matter because basically it can't shed its angular velocity, angular momentum. So it's yeah, it's unlikely to do you know, a, a nose dive into the black hole. Yeah, thanks. Um, that that's the point. Yeah, um, and for sure, it's known that although some of these are undergoing editing or even super Eddington accretion, again, I'm no expert on this, but it's known that it's, this is not a continuous process. It's not as if all of them are all the time doing. So again, it poses a challenge to starting with a small seed and managing to grow, especially by redshift by never mind redshift eleven to this sort of mass. Mm -hmm. So to say a few more words, um, I, 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 I'm not claiming it's ruled out, but if you want to start, so population three star um, astronomers are weird; they count backwards. So today is population one. Earlier population two, the very first stars were population three, the very low of metallicity. Um, I'm not saying it's ruled out, but certainly it doesn't look very compatible with this sort of plot to start with a small mass seed and then grow. And now, again, lots of accretion, extremely rapid, super Eddington, may do the job, but then you would need to explain really why it switches off. Do they, you know, do all of them basically eat up all the gas reserves sufficiently early, despite the fact that we see, you know, different types of galaxies at different redshifts, maybe. Um, other ideas would be very large gas clouds, which are sufficiently cold, manage to go a direct collapse. And you simply form a heavy seed rather than uh, the mass of a star sort of seed. Maybe there's something called runaway mergers. So you have lots of black holes and they merge very quickly, but it's hard to explain why they would merge so quickly because basically the merger of compact objects seems to be quite inefficient. You only radiate gravitational waves to lose your angular momentum and to inspire. Or, and obviously this is my own main personal interest, supermassive black holes are primordial because then you could simply have a massive seed and you don't need huge amounts of accretion. And to quote again from that review, because that's pretty much my only source, in summary, low mass seeds are common, for example, dead population three stars, but high mass seeds are rare and depend on processes which we have not yet observed. Okay. Oh, yeah. So another way to phrase this question is which came first, the, the galaxy or the supermassive black hole? Okay, so I'll move on to now to primordial black holes, which really is one of my key research topics. So this is a black hole which formed long before the CMB, typically even before Big Bang matrix synthesis. Um, just a little fact, so black hole, as you probably know, if you've on any GR course, right, the radius, the Schwarzschild radius is proportional to the mass. Uh, so for the sun, you'd have to shrink it down to about three kilometer radius. Um, so if you take the average density, I admit that doesn't mean very much for a black hole, we don't expect it to be uniform, but nonetheless, the average density would be one over the mass squared. So these supermassive black holes are actually not ridiculously dense. 
Um, astrophysically, from condensed matter, and I think there are some specialists in the audience, there's a maximum density, which gives you more or less the Chandrasekhar mass of around one solar mass. Basically, you can't compact down to a black hole or a neutron star if you're lower than this mass. Um, however, the early universe reached arbitrarily high density, so that's no issue whatsoever for the early universe. Um, um, and in fact, the idea of primordial black holes, which goes back to the 60s and 70s, uh, led Stephen Hawking to the, the, the interest in light primordial black holes and to the idea of Hawking evaporation. That's right, in, in astrophysics, Hawking, Hawking radiation is completely irrelevant. Um, so, if primordial black holes exist, well, they could explain dark matter. They could potentially explain microlensing events, um, unexpected properties of the observed mergers of uh, the black hole seen by LIGO Virgo Kagra. For example, most of those black holes are observed to be rotating slowly. And there was an expectation, admittedly with uncertainty, that most astrophysical black holes would be rotating rapidly. And apparently they're not. Possibly they're the seeds of supermassive black holes. Um, uh, I should have written this out in full. There might be a link to the pulsar timing array detection. I'll come back to this at the end if you're not familiar with that. And some people get quite carried away and basically try to explain whatever they want with uh, primordial black holes by tuning the mass and the mass function, etc. And they can obviously form gravitational waves, which is in the last decade become a very hot topic. But sorry, could, could, could you elaborate on the microlensing event? All uh, right, sure. So if you stare blindly at the same stars all for a long time, mm -hmm. there might be the occasional increase in brightness in a particular form. And that could be caused by a compact object passing between you and the background star. Basically, it will bend the light rays around now. This is called microlensing because these are of things which are too small to see the shape of. So you don't see like you, you've probably seen things like Einstein rings, which are very beautiful pictures or, you know, heavily deformed galaxies. These are large objects where you see the size and the sh deformation of the shape. Here you don't. Here you simply see that light rays are being focused more. So you see an increase in brightness and then it goes away as the, the object, the compact object moves on. Because we're talking about, it has to be very close to the line of sight mm -hmm. to have any effect. And primordial um, would be, yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it could be something like a, a neutron star or, you know, an astrophysical black hole as well. And yeah. there, there are no unambiguous detections of primordial black holes from anything. Um, That's but there are a few events seen by various of these blind searches, which are not obviously compatible either with astrophysical objects. So again, it depends on your sort of character, whether you claim this as evidence for, or rather just say, there are some unexplained observations and for the rest, we put an upper bound on yeah. the primordial black hole function. And I'll show you a constraint plot quite soon. So do, do we have a smoking gun signature of primordial black holes or? I, just... I think so. I think a, a clear detection of a subsolar mass uh -huh. on that object, because then because of the Chandrasekhar limit, yeah. it cannot be then any astrophysical compact object. Got it, thank you. Um, yeah. All right, could you just expand on what you mean by thermal history here? Oh, um, so the, the standard sort of, you know, um, cosmology 101 is that today the energy of the universe is dominated by dark energy, call it what you will. Before that it was matter domination and before that was radiation domination. Now, that's all true as far back as BBN, new bang, uh, Big Bang Nuclear Synthesis. Uh, earlier than that, it's simply a guess that it was still radiation dominated. We don't know that observationally. Um, and if you want to change that, well, one way to do it is to have very light primordial black holes because they can dominate the universe. Then you have an early matter dominated epoch. And then when they evaporate through Hawking radiation, they will reheat the universe you know, in a very interesting way through a black body spectrum of, well, everything that you can form through Hawking evaporation. And so you could have, you know, an early radiation period, 
when you form the primordial black holes, then they could dominate, create an early matter period, and then you'd have a secondary heating period by the black holes. So that sort of thing, you know, you, you, you can really make the very early universe have a much more interesting phenomenology than simply pure radiation generation. Okay, thank you. Uh, the, the challenge is if they decay so early, it's very hard to know that that happened. E either they need to re leave a relic or need to leave enough gravitational waves. Otherwise, we'll simply never find them, you know, find evidence for what happened. So ju just to come back to the idea, well, we've never found them. This is the closest I've come to finding a primordial black hole. I've no idea what PVH stood for. Right? Uh, I, I found this in a walk just above Brighton. So I had to take a photo. <laughs> That's my primordial black hole. Um, so I've been asked about constraints. Here are some constraints. Just to explain the axes first. So FPBH is a ratio of the fraction of dark matter in primordial black holes, OK? So if this is 1, then that means all of your dark matter in primordial black holes. If this is you know, 10 to the minus 2, then that's 1%. 10 to the minus 4 is you know, getting very tiny. Um, but I would stress that any detection of primordial black holes, no matter how rare, is still super exciting because it tells you the early universe was sufficiently violent on some scale to form any primordial black hole. And also, these will act as very strong gravitational attractions in the very early universe. So they will change the early structure formation and they will accrete or at least form dense halos of, for example, the rest of the dark matter around them. So uh, I'm not, I'm definitely strongly against the viewpoint that it's sort of all or nothing. I would rather say, you know, why should dark matter be only one thing? And if it's more than one thing, then we simply have a richer phenomenology. Then I, I don't think Occam's razor is particularly persuasive in this point. Occam's razor for me is more like a, you should penalize complicated models to explain simple observations. But a priori with, you know, essentially no observation of what the dark matter is. I think, you know, all, all bets are off. And, but microlensing, so microlensing constraints, as you can see, a large range of scales. Um, scales are written both in terms of grams and in terms of solar mass. That's quite common because it depends sort of which mass scale you're talking about, which one is more convenient. Um, and most, there's no, again, there's no community complete consensus, but what 99% would agree with is that around the asteroid mass range, there is an open window where all of the dark matter could be from one of the black holes. And for other ranges, either there are, for the lighter masses, they would be evaporating by today. So we would see gamma rays and there are very tight constraints on evaporation, or they're sufficiently large to either create microlensing events or gravitational waves via mergers or to be accreting etc. Um, and then the constraints are typically around the percent. Uh, I have another question. So this is assuming the abundance of PBHs over dark matter uh, today, I guess, right? That's right, yes. So then we are making an assumption about the evolution of the universe from when they were produced until now. Um, it depends on what the constraint is. So if microlensing, for example, really is from today. So there, no, there it really is comparing black holes today versus dark matter today. But for others, we are more model dependent. So like the gravitational wave signature, that does depend on how they formed and how they form binary pairs. Mm -hmm. So that, that one's definitely more model dependent. And accretion typically comes from accretion during the CMB epoch. Yeah. On the other hand, we know that the total amount of dark matter hasn't changed significantly since the CMB until today. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But yeah, it's true that um, if you really put everything together, some of the constraints come from early universe, some come from intermediate, some come from late universe. Yeah. And, and so some people try to jump through these constraints by sort of saying, well, this one applied then, but you know, I if I have huge accretion, then my mass moves as a function of time. I don't find these arguments very persuasive, but as I said, not, not everybody would accept all of these constraints. Some would say they're a bit more stringent, but relatively speaking, most people would say these are quite safe constraints. Um, and additional ones are very tentative.
Thank you. Well, are, are there any experiments planned to probe this all dark matter window? It's tricky. Um, I'll come to my second last slide will be an indirect probe of it, which will be powerful, but indirect. Um, a direct probe uh, via the gravitational waves, but yeah, I'll, I'll leave that to the end. Um, direct probes are very hard. The evaporation, basically, the lifetime of a black hole goes like the mass cubed. So if you go too much further to the right, then the Hawking evaporation today becomes utterly negligible and impossible to observe. Uh, moving microlensing to the left, the gain becomes very difficult because at some point, at some point, basically, the issue is the we're talking down here of primordial black holes about the size of an atom. And at some point, when the effect of the microlensing becomes too small, it cannot lens the entirety of the background star that you're looking at. It just lends us some fraction. And then the total change in the brightness is negligible. And th that's quite a cool idea, which I must say I'm not convinced about yet. But the idea that these, you know, sort of atom sized black holes would occasionally fall into neutron stars and that they would then gobble up the neutron star on the time scale of like millions of years, which in cosmology is quick. And so that there are constraints on this via destruction of neutron stars because we see too many for them to be destroyed quickly. Um, but calculating the cross section of a microscopic black hole with a neutron star, you can probably imagine it's pretty hard to simulate. Because typically at the first pass, they'll just punch straight through it and accrete very little. You need it to really settle down inside the neutron star to accrete enough to destroy the neutron star. Because we're talking, you know, mass is negligible compared to the neutron star mass. So um, th this is, for some people, the most exciting. For other people, it's actually a bit dull because it's very hard to probe. And, you know, th this is where things are moving. It's in this range. No, things are getting better. OK, so let me just say a few words about how we think they may have formed. Um, so the normal and quotation mark picture is that you would have a large amplitude over density generated by inflation somehow. Um, when it's super horizon, meaning when the wavelength is larger than the observable, at that time observable horizon, it cannot collapse by causality, then it re-enters the horizon, then gravity can make it attract, and then it will come down, collapse, and form a black hole. Um, so to overcome the radiation pressure, this is in the early universe, assuming radiation, you need a very large over density, so delta rho of a rho of order of half. And this is huge compared to the over density seen on CMB scales, which are more like 10 to the minus 4. Um, so the power spectrum would need to grow from the observed value on large scales, about 10 to the minus 9, to avoid a 10 to the minus 2, such that you would get an interesting abundance of primordial black holes. So this comes back to uh, Venus, to one of your early questions. Um, we wouldn't expect this to happen in general. You can do it. There are models. So for example, in inflation, this is going really beyond the topic of my talk, but just to mention briefly, if you have a period called ultra slow roll, say if you have an inflection point in your potential, you get an exponential instability. So then your perturbations can grow exponentially and it's quite easy to grow large. The problem then is rather that you tend to grow too large and actually you rule out the model. So you need to fine tune that you grow large, but not so large that it's already dead. Um, and what's nice about this relation is that... And just out of curiosity, how many mm -hmm. foldings do you need in that? Ah, so you need about three, between two and three. Okay. Oh, not so, but, but one can calculate it with more precision. It's just that's what I remember at the top of my head. Good, yeah. So sure. compared to about 60 for the total from the CMB scale till the end. Yeah. So a pretty small fraction. Yeah. And yeah, but let's say we saw a primordial black hole. We would then sort of approximately equate it to the horizon mass at the time it formed. You can then equate that to the to the inverse length scale, the Fourier mode k. And you can also relate that to the time in the early universe, which you can also relate to an energy scale, etc. So the early universe is kind of like a particle accelerator where you reach arbitrarily high energies. And if you know the mass, then there's basically one, one scale sets everything. So one scale sets the energy, it sets the horizon mass, it sets 
and the Fourier mode inverse length scale. It sets the time. It also sends the uh, frequency for the gravitational waves, which could be produced at the same time. So that's nice, right? So when one can connect different scales quite naturally in cosmology. Um, and here we've done that. This is an older paper from 2010, uh, led by one of my former students, Andrew Gao. So here's the primordial power spectrum as a function of scale, or on the top as a function of mass. Notice that they run the other way. Um, a large K corresponds to a small physical scale, which corresponds to a small horizon mass. Okay. And as I said, you need the power spectrum to grow to be of order 10 to the minus 2 to form primordial black holes. So these red and blue lines are the upper bound, the constraint from primordial black holes. Um, for depending on the peak, this is assuming either a narrow or a broad peak in your primordial power spectrum. So on the scales we observe, it's quite flat. You would need to have a large amplitude peak. And exactly the details depend then on the shape of the peak. Um, but for this talk, again, don't worry too much about that. And there's a very interesting point, which is if you think of LIGO, Virgo, Cagra, they observe things between about 1 and 100 solar mass. That happens to be where the gravitational wave detection of pulsar timing array lies, for those who know about that. Um, basically, it's seen a gravitational wave background, which is different from individual events as seen by LIGO. Um, and in the early universe, you know, just going back to this, that uh, you can relate a horizon scale to a physical scale or to a time or an energy scale. The QCD transition or occurred around the solar mass scale by coincidence in the early universe. And that's important because during the QCD era, the pressure dropped. And then when the pressure drops, it becomes exponentially easier to have gravitational collapse to form a primordial black hole. So it's a very interesting range to probe. And then on larger scales, closer to the CMB, you've got this cosmic mean distortion, which I'm going to explain in, uh, shortly. But you can see this is a very tight constraint. It's tighter than the primordial black hole constraint. So Sorry, what are the just green orange lines on your bottom lef left of the plot? Oh, this, so the cosmic microwave background, this is basically the one and two sigma constraints in the primordial power spectrum. So here it's a detection. Here it's detection, meaning it's ruled up below and above. Here it's an upper bound only, we have no detection. But you can see, right, if we saw any primordial black hole, we would know, at least for this formation mechanism, which, as I said, is considered the standard, that the power spectrum had done something really very interesting and grown dramatically onto small scales. And you, you would need something non-standard in your inflationary model, such as an inflection point, to be able to do that. So you would immediately rule out all of the simplest single field and slow roll models of inflation. They would be gone completely. Which for me would be a great thing, because I find them quite dull. <laughs> but the universe obviously doesn't care about our preference. Um, could you question? Yes, by QCD scale, do you mean the confinement scale or something different? Um, yeah, so the, the scale um, at which the quarks get bound together to form hadrons. Okay. And it, of course, it's a continuous process, well, semi continuous process, right, with multiple masses of quarks. But the key scale is around when the horizon scale is about one solar mass. Yeah. And it, of, of all the standard model physics, that gives the largest reduction in pressure. So can, can you explain what, what you mean by that coincidence? Because I, I'm not sure how you're identifying scales. Oh, I see. So um, that goes back to this. I haven't explained how this relates to energy, but as a function of time, you can also work out what the total energy would be of the universe. It's simply by working out the amount of stuff and then scaling it like, you know, like matter goes like one over the scale factor cubed, uh, radiation like one over the scale factor or the power, etc. Yeah. So that tells you the energy, the relevant energy scale of, say, the photons in the early universe. Well, it's, that, it's, it's that scale you're using to uh, to just saying to to try and and identify how they're you know, like, yes 
Yeah. So basically, the the photons are redshifting, and that reduces their energy. So if you go backwards in time, they're more energetic. And if you keep going back to the very early universe, you reach the scale where the photon is powerful enough to to stop atomic nuclei forming, or not just sorry, not just the nuclei to even form stop the hadrons getting bound together. Yes. And that that sort of relates the 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 energy scale of the universe to the QCD scale. Yeah. Right, you, you so by by the energy scale of the universe at that time, do you mean the temperature? That's equivalent. To me, yeah, 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 temperature, temperature yeah, equivalent, yeah. yeah. In units where K Boltzmann is equal to one. Okay, so oh, I see. So you you mean the ten? All right, now I have it. Okay. 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 Maybe I should have said temperature. So it's just the it's you're you're saying that um, there's a, an energy scale set by the temperature, and yes. if I use that scale, then they are yeah. they are all the same. That's right. Because uh, monologists just says it's know. quite lazy. We tend to set all the units equal to one. Well, we do as well, so that's not <laughs> a big problem. But. The, uh, the the thing is that you're very different uh, physics associated with the uh, these ones and the, pul the pulsar timings. Um, I mean, I can uh, see the QCD scale, and I can I know right. how to identify a temperature associated with that. Right. I am having little difficulty with the pulsar. I see ones. Uh, how that that would fit into a similar type of scale? Okay. I know they're. I'm not sure what, what physics you're extracting from that. Okay, so pulsar timing array is extracting gravitational waves. Gravitational waves have a frequency. They do have a frequency, yes. Right, and that frequency... Yeah, but they, they have two frequencies. I mean, there's, a, there's, a, there's the frequency at which the pulsar is emitting gravitational waves, and then there's this, uh, ah. this timing array, which has another frequency, which is a slow, much low, right. longer wave frequency, which is... People like to attribute to gravitational background radiation. That's right. I'm talking about the latter. You're talking about the latter one. Yes. The gravitational yeah. background radiation. Yes. So completely that. So there, the, the link to pulses is purely that they're useful clocks. It's nothing to do with the physics of the pulsar itself. Okay. And that that frequency scale then relates to basically the speed of light and uh, the the link scale of causality in the early universe, which is essentially the Hubble distance. It seems like it would be a much lower temperature than the temperature associated with the uh, uh, with the QCD scale. So how that's how you're getting them to be the same? I'm. Um, I'm still. I mean, if you plug in all the numerical constants, it turns out to be the same scale. Remember, these things have redshifted all dramatically. So these the gravitational ah, this might be the key. So. Off the top of my head, I don't remember what the redshift of the QCD scale is, but it, it's enormous. And so these gravitational waves were actually, they were high frequency at the time they formed, but then they've stretched out by the expansion. Yes. Of the okay. Ever since then. So by today, they're low frequency. So you are you are talking about the frequency at the time that these things are formed. Yes, but then you have to map it by scaling it by the growth. No, that's, no, that's okay. I yeah. can do that. Yeah. Yeah. Until today. Are you saying that they would be coincidence? Yeah. Okay. And you're talking about that. Well, I, my understanding is that that uh, those gravitational wave, that uh, ambient uh, gravitational wave background, uh, is doesn't fit the data very well for those that timing. That is debated. I, I'm certainly not saying that they are um, okay. stochastic gravitational wave background. I'm just saying that if they are. They happen to fall in the right place. Okay. Which is interesting because, right, it's the only stochastic gravitational wave background ever observed, and that happens to fall in the right place. If it has been observed, yeah. Well, I, I would say that gravitational waves have been observed. Yeah, but the stochastic one is... Oh. The, the conjecture is you're saying that it, that, that is responsible for the timing area. Oh, the that's certainly a conjecture. I would say that the pulse of timing have observed something. They have observed something, yes. And then if it's due to this, then it's an interesting coincidence. Okay. I see. You're, yeah. you're saying, let us assume that it is that. Yes. And then take the scale from that. And... Yeah. But even if you assume it's not from that, it's then nonetheless at the level where you're putting in interesting constraints. 
Yes, but you couldn't map it back to uh, to when you think that they were uh, that correct. Uh, Absolutely correct. Right. Right. No, 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 that's true. Okay. Yeah. Right. I I think the redshift for confinement would be something of the order of ten to the eleven. Oh, thanks. Thanks. Right. It's massive. Yes. Yeah. Thanks. Absolutely. Uh, thank, thanks. That was quick. And uh, here the the. The period of these is like one over a decade. So if you convert that into <laughs> frequency multiplied with speed of light, hopefully you get the same thing. And then rate shift by 10 to the 11. Right. So, I mean, that, that plot was showing you something right about probing lots of different scales. Admittedly, not very well, but nonetheless going to small scales. So basically, we know cosmology to high accuracy on some scales, quite a limited range. In terms of e-folds, somebody mentioned e-folds, about six e-folds out of the total around 60 e-folds. Um, so it is interesting to find something else beyond the CMB where you can probe more scales, albi more weakly. So let me say a few words about uh, spectral distortions. And that's where um, my collaboration was important because uh, Sharma and Les Gouk, they are experts on the spectral distortion. So the CMB is known to be an extremely precise black body. It has a very, very good black body spectrum. Uh, of all, any deviation must be less than of order about 10 to the minus five in dimensionless units. Now, my, why might you have a deviation? The early universe wasn't very good thermal equilibrium, but if you did have very large amplitude perturbations, then you'll have a baryon photon plasma, which will be oscillating and damping. It will damp through friction. And for a certain range of scales or for certain redshifts, it's no longer possible to regain full thermal equilibrium because the interaction rate between the baryons and the photons will no longer be high, well, the electrons really and the photons will no longer be high enough to reach full thermal equilibrium. And the mu distortion looks something like a chemical potential for those who are chemists. Uh, I'm not. Uh, with uh, the mu distortion, so the mu being proportional to the amplitude of the power spectrum. And in fact, it works in a linear way. Uh, and this just sort of shows that, again, I'm not the expert, but uh, um, the, this contribution of a given amplitude of perturbation uh, primarily comes from the diffusion, not from the sound or the cosmological horizon, but from the diffusion horizon, which is one of the energies primarily being dumped into the plasma, which is, again, quite different from the mean free path of the photons, which is very, very small before the CMB form, because basically there's such a thick soup of electrons and everything else that they keep interacting. Um, so for some range of scales, You've got very tight constraints because Kobe virus did not observe any deviation from a perfect black body spectrum. Um, so let me zoom into that part of the plot. So here's the, again the amplitude of the prime model power spectrum. The red constraint is the cosmic mu constraint. And here I'm showing different constraints on prime model black holes. They're nearly horizontal lines for different values of the fraction of dark matter being in prime model black holes. And I'm focusing on the supermassive black hole range here. So from 10 to the 4 up to 10 to the 13 solar mass. Um, and you can see now, this is assuming Gaussianity. So for Gaussian perturbations, you simply cannot have very heavy primordial black holes because you would overgenerate uh, cosmic mu distortion, and that's strongly ruled out. The, the difference here is orders of magnitude. And that, that was already known before us. So that's not new. Um, the question then, which we were asking as well, what can you do to break that? Okay, can you get around this constraint? Okay, so let me explain in a sort of slightly hand wavy way what the idea is. So a primordial black hole, if they exist, they're very rare. That's for sure. Especially during radiation domination when they form, they're a very small fraction of the universe at most, which could form into them. So these are probing the tail of the PDF. Spectral distortions feel all of the perturbations on all of, you know, with any amplitude, so they mainly form from the peak of the PDF. So the idea of the game to play here is to say, well, deep in the tail of my PDF, where my primordial black holes form, I want to boost it by having some large positive skewness, such that I get a bigger tail, whilst I don't want to boost the peak amplitude so much, such that I'm consistent with the mute constraints. 
Okay. So that's what we did. We said, okay, instead of assuming Gaussian, and by the way, on large scales, it's known that the perturbations are very close to Gaussian. But on small scales, we don't know that. So here we're taking for the those with expert knowledge, the infinite FNL limits or the pure Gaussian squared limits. Um, where we redo then the constraints on primordial black holes are basically the amplitude you would need to form some interesting number of massive primordial black holes. The constraints come down as expected because we're boosting now the tail to over densities. But nonetheless, you can see the cosmic mu distortion. A, it barely changes between uh, Gaussian or Gaussian squared. So and B, just, just to clarify, this is an ad hoc uh, assumption that you're just making. Let's very ad hoc, assume yeah. that it uh, that the tails are larger than, uh, than yes. Gaussian. Let's see. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but but there are models where one can do this, like some forms of hybrid inflation, etc. No, that, that's fine. I'm happy to accept that. Yeah. The, yeah. the tails we know very little about, so let's yeah. assume they're, they're larger than you might think, and how large yeah. they have to be. All right. Okay. Yeah. But this is not large enough. And that's what we've shown here. And also, we, we were the first to show that the cosmic medius constraint really doesn't change much when you stop assuming Gaussian. That, that wasn't known before. Um, so we then thought, well, you but know. Just, just to clarify, what assumptions are you putting into, uh, aside from, I mean, uh, it's not clear to me that there is a huge correlation between the peak and uh, and the tails. Of oh, so, right. So here we're assuming the whole thing is Gaussian squared, not just the peak. Sorry, not just the tail. We're assuming the whole PDF is given by the square of a Gaussian. So a chi-squared PDF. Oh, you or you want to assume that you want to fit it to that model rather yeah. than just uh, yeah. yeah. So okay. we're not just changing the tail; we're changing the whole PDF. Oh, what's the motivation for changing it in that particular form? It's pretty ad hoc, but um, there there are fairly extreme inflationary models where you can do this. Okay. Um, well, but, why, uh, why don't you just change the tail? That that I feel is even more ad hoc because then. I mean, you could, but uh, well, the tail that we should be more sensitive to to non Gaussianity than yeah, but, but we are of course doing that right here. The tail is the tail. I, of the I understand, square. but I would have thought you could put it. You could say, let me just take a something that's superimposed on a Gaussian, which I is, see. Yes, I mean which, maybe um, which enhances the tails, but has very little effect in the uh, mm -hmm. on that. I, I I would have thought well. That seems reasonable to me. It's just one one could do that. Yes. Uh, one downside is then, and but you'll see there are other cases. We wouldn't know how to redo the chi squared. Sorry, the mu constraint, the distortion constraint, or an ad hoc for the primordial black hole because you're more or less just integrating the tail. It's easy to do, but yeah. anything you know, it's trivial. But for the mu distortion, this was the big part of. There were two papers. The first paper was really. How do you redo the mu constraint? Can, can you explain the mu constraint again? Because I, I didn't quite catch it. So it, it's quite saying? technical, but um, we're really asking how would the energy injection from the large amplitude perturbations in the plasma uh, change the, what was initially a black body spectrum to being non black body? And so to study that, you need to basically look at how the average delta T over T will interact. Well, we'll look even at the level of the two and the three-point correlation functions Okay. and see what impact that has. And that, that's hard to do, but you need to actually know the, the real space correlation functions. And if you simply ad hoc change the tail, you don't know what, you know, what the equivalent correlation function would be. Or at least I don't know what it would be. And so I wouldn't know how to do the mu constraint. It sounds like they should be correlated. I mean, changing the um, the higher correlators will show up more on the tails. Yes, that's absolutely right. So, so you get a large that bicycle. back in uh, almost by just saying I'm uh, by essentially reconstructing the probability distribution from from those those um, moments. Um, 
Maybe is my honest answer. I, I think it's not easy. Um, using like there's the Edgeworth expansion and the things like that. They tend to break down where things get interesting. Yeah. So right. yeah. In principle, I agree. In practice, I think actually getting the calculation to work to where you need to go is not. Yeah, might not be feasible. Okay. Um, unless you're, you you know you might have better techniques. And so, but, so we said, well, then, okay, chi-squared, that was semi-motivated, that didn't work. Let's just go further. Again, then for the primordial black hole, we can keep redoing the calculation. For the mu constraint, sadly, we cannot. So here I'm showing the Gaussian mu constraint and the chi-squared mu constraint, and superimposing the highly non-Gaussian, either Gaussian to the fourth power or Gaussian to the fifth power, uh, curvature perturbation constraints, either for some reasonable value of FPBH or for the in the green is when there's simply only one primordial black hole in the whole of in, entire observable universe. And what you can see is that yeah, basically once you get to Gauss into the power fifth, so you're really changing the tail dramatically, but you're changing everything, you can form the primordial black hole line becomes lower than the mu distortion. So at this point, yes, you can do it. But I, I want to be clear that no actual model exists to do this. It's a parameterization. We've shown model builders that if you can find it, then this will work. But it's very extreme. And as I say, there, there are issues. Um, well, it's more than a little bit difficult to do this because I've worked on inflation myself and I know it's not going to be easy. Um, okay. Um, Maybe in view of the time, I'll skip, I think, that slide and talk a bit more about sort of the future. Um, so once a black hole forms, it has no memory that we can see of how it formed. You know, so how would we know? Um, this is difficult. It's like then the hawking noah hair theorem, right? The black hole can have mass, spin, in principle, electric charge, but they're all going to be neutral. And that's all. Um, so you, you basically got to do a population level analysis, um, which is hard. And also accretion tends to delete the initial properties. So, you know, if, if the supermassive black holes had small seeds, then what you're seeing is the effect of accretion, which tends to spin them up rather than the initial condition. Um, isolated black holes are certainly very hard to spot. So you could just say, you know, what, what happens in a black hole? Well, unless you're willing to die for the cause. Um, but even if you did, you wouldn't be able to transmit back to anyone else what you found. Um, so that's hard. But nonetheless, I am going to end on a fairly optimistic note, which is to say these gravitational waves. So let me just explain in a touch more detail. Why can we observe gravitational waves? Or why, why would they tell us about the amplitude of the primordial power spectrum, which is of scalar perturbations? I should explain this. So if you've done your sort of cosmology 101 course, you will have been told that the perturbations split into scalar vector and tensor and that they are all decoupled from each other. That's true only at the linear theory level. And linear theory on the CMB scales, you know, very, very small amplitude perturbations is excellent. However, on uh, much smaller scales where we don't know that the perturbations are small, you have to go to nonlinear theory. And then if you have very large amplitude scalar perturbations at second order, they will source gravitational waves. And these secondary gravitational waves, which would look like a stochastic background, which could be what the time and array have seen, would, um, well, they would survive. They will not be you know, wiped out by radiation pressures in the early universe. So they will basically just free stream through the early universe we're shifting away happily. Um, and the good thing is gravitational waves, right? They're now a hot topic. There is, you know, and so SKA at the moment, the constraint is around here, but with the, uh, sorry, pulsar timing array constraint is up, up around 10 to the minus two, but with the square kilometer array, which is being built, there are people at Sussex working on this. So a radio wave uh, survey. Um, in a few decades' time, admittedly, it's going to reach much, much constraints. 
Then I was asked about the all uh, the asteroid mass window, where a combination of LISA, which is a space-based interferometer on a scale of like something. I want to say a million kilometers wavelength. It's something scarily large. Um, you know, that, that's probing completely different frequencies than have ever been probed before. And then something like the Einstein telescope, which is not massively bigger than LIGO Virgo, but substantially more sensitive. Uh, it should be possible to indirectly form, uh, probe at least the formation time or the equivalent frequency to the formation time of primordial black holes of essentially any mass which are heavy enough to have not evaporated by today. So even if you know some of these things are very hard to probe directly, we should see the impact of their formation or else rule them out. And that's different from some of the dark matter candidates. Basically, you know, some of them only form at very high energies, which can never be reached by a detector on Earth. And then, you know, unless they're something like a wimp, how are we ever going to find them? Well, at least here, I think the story can be closed. It will take some, some more decades, but eventually we'll either know, we'll either find a signal or be able to rule this out. So to summarize with a picture of Brighton Beach, um, supermassive black holes definitely exist, but their formation is still unknown. Primordial black holes might or might not exist. Um, to form them is hard, but at least we understand how they would form in principle. And supermassive primordial black holes unfortunately conflict with the CMB spectral distortions at high significance. And you need a very exotic, highly non-Gaussian model to evade that. And right, that's that's all. Thanks for lots of questions. Okay, thank you. What a nice summary. No, thank you. Yeah, I'm happy to take more questions. Just open the window a bit more. Can, can I ask a question? I mean, I think Denjo asked earlier, but um, um, I'm not sure I I, I understood the answer. Um, <clears throat> The 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 um between fifty and hundred solar mass black holes that the gravitational wave people are are, are discovering. Um, do we do we any idea how many of those there are? Do, is there any is there enough data now to get some idea of the mass function? Um, yes, there is some, and people have done tricks, um, including work I was involved with on like comparing astrophysical to primordial black hole for different mass functions. And there are now, by now, there's a void, more than 100 events. So you can certainly see that they seem to be a bit bimodal. There's some preference around 10 solar mass, and then another peak around maybe more 30 plus solar mass, um, which is consistent-ish with the astrophysical models. Uh, in detail, nothing seems to fit brilliantly, but we should remember astrophysics is messy, you know, mm, probing collapse into a black hole is messy. Um, primordial black holes, the weakness of them is there's no particular reason other than the QCD transition why you should be in the solar mass scale at all. Because a priori, they could have been, you know, Planck relics or they could have been supermassive. Um, and the, obviously the detector was built on a scale suitable for astrophysical black holes and it's finding them there. But there's also the question of spin. They, most of them are consistent with zero spin or very small rotation. And again, I, I don't want to overstate the case. I'm, I certainly don't know much about core collapse, supernova, but if you'd asked people 15, 20 years ago, do you expect astrophysical black holes to rotate quickly? They would have said yes. Now they say, well, it depends on this and that. And if you eject the angular momentum in the outer layers, then the core is slowly spinning. I'm not sure to what extent that's, you know, it, to me, it feels like a post-diction not a prediction. Um, but equally, you know, when, when, when the modeling is very hard, one shouldn't get too excited if the initial simple modeling was wrong. So I am not trying to always sell this as, you know, a hint for primordial black holes, but equally I would say it's, it's in the interesting regime. And, and the, the data just keeps getting better, right? There's more and more detections. And, but, but for me, the smoking gun would be a sub solar mass. Because then it's really, I think, quite safe that like they cannot be astrophysical, and that would be, you know, that would be my Christmas for sure. 
I, can I ask about the uh, supermassive ones? And um, mm -hmm. um, I mean, the supermassive ones, they, I would have guessed that they were meant to be associated with the, um, structure formation. Uh, and the structure formation, and uh, um, if I understand the, the the way that's meant to work, is that you take the imprint of the primordial fluctuations on the dark matter, mm -hmm. evolve it, and it gives you the filaments mm -hmm. on which uh, the galaxies uh, condense. Mm -hmm. And at those nodes, we we are finding the uh, supermassive black holes. But you're saying that uh, if I you, what you seem to be saying is that if I take those fluctuations, I won't find the primordial black holes there to begin with to seed those galaxies. Mm. That that doesn't quite work. Is that what you're saying? So if if the primordial power spectrum stays flat onto all scales then yes, you won't seed any supermassive black holes directly by gravitational collapse. It will need to be then via astrophysics. The astrophysical mechanism is unknown. I'm certainly not saying it's impossible, but it's unknown. You, you won't form them at horizon entry through direct collapse. So you really, I mean, if I evolve the dust, uh, that uh, the dark matter dust, Yeah. You're saying it from those fluctuations, the endpoint of that evolution won't be dense enough to uh, to form uh, supermassive black holes. That's correct. Yeah. That is that another mechanism is necessary in there. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. And, Remember, with uh, angular with a uh, with dark matter, it's very hard for it to lose its angular momentum. Yes, yeah, exactly. So it's very hard for it to become very sufficiently compressed to form yes. a, a black hole. Of well, any on, on, unless there's another mechanism in there in the dark matter, where it it can lose it to other dark matter. That that's true, and there are even models with dark radiation, uh, things like that. And then, yeah, that that could be. We, it yes. doesn't really need to be dark matter. I mean, it just means that it that the dark matter has to be interacting. That's it, right. It, it, so it, it, almost any interaction should be enough to give the uh, uh, dark matter allow it to lose energy to other dark matter. Mm -hmm. In the in the sense that ordinary matter that interacts can uh, can collapse that way. That's true. But remember, from galaxy rotation curves, you cannot have a collapse too much. Otherwise, we wouldn't see the flat rotation curves yes. out of large radio. So it, there's a delicate game here to be played yeah. to make it collapse more than in pure collisionless dark matter, but not so much that you ruin the success of dark matter. Yeah. And I think that's the challenge. Right. Well, that's certainly one of the challenges. Yeah. OK, I see. Yeah, interesting. These are all very good questions, by the way. Yeah. Yeah, anyway. I think it's exciting when we don't actually know how something formed because they're there. Yes, no, no, it is exciting. It'd be nice to have a little bit more experimental evidence, information to, to go on. It would, it would. And I mean, I'm hopeful that with, you know, the longer JWST takes these high range of observations, uh, you know, there's a lot of people maybe slightly jumping the gun about very, very high range shift. Everyone's in a race to say the highest range of this or that. And, but I think in a couple more years, it will have settled down and people will really start to extend that plot I showed near the beginning. Uh -huh. You know, the... This remarks, yes. Yeah, you know, I'm hoping this x-axis will extend to 10. And then, you know, the accretion models will really be squeezed or understood much better. Because uh -huh. uh, that's not yet been done, you know. Finding a few isolated objects is not enough to convince anyone. Yeah. It's meant to fly, I think, for close to a decade. So, you know, there's a lot of time for it to take a lot more data and then for the modeling to catch up. So which experiment are you referring the to? JWST. Oh, the JWST. Oh, the JWST, yeah. Okay. Because, yeah. right, it's extremely exquisite data that it's getting. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. There are people here, not me, but like Steve Wilkins, the head of the astronomy group, he's heavily involved in this. He, he often says, ah, you know, another group, bloody group saying they found the range of 11. Don't believe it. So, <laughs> but nonetheless, even if it's eight, you know, I'm, I'm still excited. <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, you know, the further out you can get there, the better, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, when it comes to this story of producing primordial black holes, does anything really change when they're produced via phase transitions versus uh, primordial fluctuations? Uh, yes. So the the linking the scale to the black hole to the black hole mass to the horizon mass does get broken because now they're forming on subhorizon scales. Um, in many models, now you you might know more than me, but um, in many models, so I think the scales are not exponentially smaller than the horizon mass. So it might be a factor of a few or an order of magnitude, but not many orders of magnitude. So I think, you know, the general picture is not completely wrong, what I've described, but the, the details, for like, for example, that coincidence of scales I pointed out, that that might not be so convincing with a phase transition model. On the other hand, the formation maybe becomes easier. Like if it's true that cosmic strings, you know, produce a black hole when they intersect, then that would be pretty cool, right? But again, we don't know if cosmic strings exist, so. But, so I, I think the very broad brush picture I've described, including the mean distortion, will still be true, but in detail, you'd have to redo all of this. Hmm. And so, I mean, there's lots of research to be done still. Even though it's become a very big field, it's you know there, there's still a tendency that you do what you can, and then the, there are always plenty of open questions at the end of your research, which is not unusual. But so the, the field has really grown from you know quite a quite a niche topic to quite a mainstream one in, in about the last decade. And a lot of the earlier work really was order of magnitude. Now people are really trying to include all the order one factors properly. And it's hard work to do that. And at some point you need numerical simulations. But your bottom line is that uh, primordial black holes as uh, as black dark matter candidates are far, is, they're far from ruled out. Oh, absolutely. They're, they're still, they're, this window, I think, almost nobody would disagree that this is still open, yeah. Okay. But a few people would still argue they could be around the solar mass, and in my mind, that's really real there. They argue that they're very tightly clustered and that the gravitational wave constraints are simply misunderstood because the binary formation mechanism is wrong. But uh, yeah, I, I think this window is very safe and will be for at least a decade. In my mind, all the other windows have been closed, apart from maybe the relic window. So if 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 Hawking evaporation stops when you reach the quantum scale, then you could have quantum relics, right? And then how would we find them is the problem. I'm not sure we can, but you could argue that's another window to the very far left in this plot. But again, that's kind of arguably new physics, whereas this one is not. This is simply a new initial condition. Yeah. So we don't know new dark matter as a new particle. That, that we don't know yet. If, if I remember correctly, you were working on having like small extra dimensions coupled to these black holes so that their evaporation rate would be small. Did that go anywhere? Um, you might have been talking to Itzy. Maybe. So um, that's proved to be a bit of a, <laughs> a non, you know, a never ending story so that there's no actual result. There's no publication yet. Um, it is certainly true that the the evaporation or the Hawking evaporation works differently in extra dimensions. And the size of the black hole is also different in extra dimensions. Also the Planck scale is different. So yes, so the, um, the window moves, that's for sure. But in detail, exactly how it moves, it, it seems to get wider, but in detail, that uh, I'm afraid that we're still not finished. I would hope this summer, but... <laughs> I mean, I could work it out, but to if I take the middle of that range there, say ten to the minus uh, fourteen uh, solar mm -hmm. mass, mm -hmm. ones, 
uh, what would the density, what would the local density be implied for those in for our own solar system, for our own um, galaxy? How, if I remember right, the typical down, distance between them. Yeah, I think when you're down at the boundary of evaporation, mm -hmm. I, I actually said this as a cosmology <laughs> workshop exercise. It was roughly the typical separation was of order the astronomical unit. One AU. Oh. Yeah, something like that. So not. Oh, well, then, um, that's that's a few of them in our in our solar system. Yes. Right? Yeah, I think it was quite a few of them in the solar system at the lower end there. Yes, I think it really got quite. Yeah, in in cosmology terms, that's a lot. That's a lot. Of course, yeah. in uh, normal dark matter terms, that's tiny, right? Normally, they're talking about enormous numbers per second through every square centimeter for WIMPs, say. Yes. But but less. We... Yeah, there's, there's, there's quite a lot. So, um, which is why, uh, yeah, the, this idea that they will, you know, occasionally be captured by neutron stars and then destroy the neutron star might not be so ridiculous. Or if one of them could plow into us very easily. And that... well, actually, this, this is a funny one. I got asked by new scientists about an idea that they would leave craters on the moon. Yes. <laughs> um, the thing is, these craters would be, mic you know, just so small. Be quite... okay. Sort of micro sort of craters. So um, it's not, you know, we don't have resolution maps of the moon of that level to see them. It's an interesting idea, and for the slightly heavier mass, at some point, yes, they would leave like multiple meter sized creature. Then, um, <laughs> I thought that was a fun idea. Um, but why wouldn't they just pass straight through the moon? Well, I mean, if they're not if they're not baryonic at all, they... they're not. But there's they're the very strong right gravitational impacts. Would that be strong enough? Would that be strong enough to leave a scar? The claim was yes. Mm. I haven't done the calculation myself, but yes, the claim was yes, it would. Well, yeah, presumably it depends on the, the velocity with which they are yes. control as well. Yes. So there must be some estimate for the velocity of these ones. And... That's right. There, there is a sort of typical velocity dispersion of objects at this distance from the centre of the galaxy to give an idea, which right. is rather fast. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But I think they were taking that into account. I will, I'm sure they would, because if it's just going s slowly through a, a, a foot a minute or something like that, they'll start accumulating pretty rapidly. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. It's for sure uh, vastly faster than that, yeah. Uh, yeah, we're, we're talking quite exotic ideas here. But, no, no. Uh, but no, it's fun. And I mean, why not? It's, you know, it's... <laughs> just shows that we know about dark matter. Yeah, imagine if we found dark matter by seeing, uh, you know, by doing geology on the moon. How cool would that be? <laughs> Perhaps I will stop the recording at this point. Mm -hmm. Sure. Just maybe I'll stop the share. Thank you very much again for a very stimulating talk. Absolutely, yeah. That was really good. Thank you. Oh, brilliant. I'm glad you enjoyed it. You're very welcome. And nice to meet you all. Uh, you too, yeah.